open our Bibles tonight to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I'm going to use a passage tonight. We oftentimes preach from this passage when we have the Lord's Supper. But there's something important I want you to get tonight from this passage of Scripture. This is really the last time of fellowship that the Lord Jesus has with his disciples just prior to him going to, to, to suffer at Calvary for us. The very last time of fellowship. And he requested that time of fellowship. And there's some, just a few simple thoughts I want to share with you that are really important for the Christian. And so in, in Luke 22 and verse 14, it says, When the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after, this, uh, after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you. So here the Lord was having his very last time of fellowship. Next event, he's going to be at Calvary. The apostles are going to be absolutely astounded that the Savior, that many of them left everything to follow, is going to be crucified. And here in this supper time, he said, I, I want you to understand this is a time of memorial. I want you to remember this. And then we know that in the in the book of 1 Corinthians, we read where the practice of the Lord's Supper that we do, that's not to save anybody. Those elements have no saving power. It's just a memorial. It's to remember. And he gave us some specific uh, responsibilities in the Lord's Supper as often as you would. Remember me, he said. Remember me. You know, I, I remember, I look back over my life, and I, I can remember well the when I left high school. And during my senior year, my parents had, my dad had been transferred in his job at that time, about two and a half hours south of where I went to high school. And uh, it was right during the middle of my senior year of high school, my baseball coach went and talked to my dad and said, would you allow Tim to live with me during the week and he can come down there on the, on the weekend so he can finish out his senior year and play baseball and all of that. And, and so I did. But I, I, re, I remember the final day when I was, after graduation, the next day I was going to be going down to where my parents lived now, and from there it would just be a few weeks that I would head off to college. And I remember those last goodbyes from high school. I, I remember well my very last football game I ever played. I still remember it very well. I can remember specific plays uh, in that football game. I remember the, the last days sitting next to my mother's bedside when she was dying and the conversation we had. You know, you remember those kind of special times. And here this was a special time with the Lord and his apostles. And he said, I want you to remember that, that when, when you take of that, that bread, I want you to remember how my body was broken for you. I want you to remember how that my blood was shed for you. You see, he, he said he desired this time before he was going to go suffer. And then he tells his church, as often as you would, I want you to practice this, practice to remember. Now, he didn't tell them to remember the fun times. He didn't tell them to remember the, the laughter and the good food and things that we oftentimes remember. But there were life-changing things he wanted them to never forget. And there's three life-changing things that I want to mention to you 
that he didn't want them to forget and he doesn't want you to forget in your daily life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, he wants you to never forget nobody will ever love you like he loved you. Nobody will ever love you like he loved you. He said in remembrance of me. He wanted them to remember. It's just a few days now that I'm going to go to Calvary and I'm going to suffer. A, a, a suffering that was beyond comprehension. I want you to know Hollywood has never been able to paint a true picture of what Jesus went through when he was on Calvary. The Bible says every joint in his body was dislocated. His numbers looked up and uh, his, uh, his uh, bones looked up and, and stared at him. He wasn't even recognized to be human according to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. I mean, he was beaten beyond human recognition. I remember as a kid when I was growing up and hearing my dad preach and, 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 and I'd hear the cross described and I would think to myself, why did it have to be so gruesome? You know, why did Calvary have to be so, I mean, it was beyond a horror picture. Why did it have to be so awful? And then I did come to understand. He was paying for my sin. It was my sin. I want to tell you, nobody will ever love you like our Lord loves you. And he wanted us to never forget that. In Revelation 1 and verse 5, it says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 1 John 3, 16, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Look at Romans chapter 8. These are wonderful verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. It says, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things nor a present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You understand tonight, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, I'm not talking about if you've joined a church or you've gone through some classes of studies. I'm not talking about if you've turned over a new leaf in life or you've been through baptismal waters. None of those things have ever gotten anybody to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus Christ. It's not through a preacher. It's not through a church. It's not through baptism. It's only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That begins when we come with a repentant heart, confessing we're sinners deserving of hell and giving him our heart and life. It's not about, well, you know, I know that, that guy over, he, he believes in God. Well, the Bible says the devil believes and trembles. You understand? I mean, mentally, intellectually, the devil knows everything is true in this book. That would mean he's saved. You can have it all up here, folks, and never have it down here. So it's not just about acknowledging that God's alive and that Jesus is alive and that he died and he was buried and rose. It's not about just intellectually acknowledge, acknowledging that. It's beginning a heart relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When I married my wife, I gave her my heart. I mean, she has my affection. She, she has my commitment of faithfulness. When I got saved, I gave my Lord and Savior my heart. And he has my commitment to him. And so beginning this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, once you're saved, here the scripture says, all of these, I love the, all the things listed here. Brother, we were talking about this before, this, uh, before tonight. And he, he lists, all these things were more than conquerors. He said, I persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, devil, uh, demons and devils, and nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. Folks, 
Those who tell you that you can lose your salvation are not telling you the truth of the Bible. When I trusted Jesus, the Bible said, now, now that you've given your heart to me, nothing, none of all these things, none of them can separate you from me anymore. You're my child forever. But nobody will ever love you like that again, like Jesus loves you tonight. There's an old preacher that on his deathbed, a younger preacher came and he, he, said, he said, I just want to glean from you. You, you preached all these years and, and in, impacted many lives for the Lord. You've studied your Bible all these years and, and now I know that you're, you're about to go see Jesus. And Could you just share with me the greatest truth that you've ever come across? And that old preacher picked his head off of his pillow and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It is the greatest truth. If you'll never forget that nobody will love you like he loves you, you won't be tempted to give your love to somebody else above him. You won't be tempted to, to take him out of the seat of priority and put friends up there like the principle that was taught tonight that those that are, are living ungodly, you won't allow them to draw you away from the one that you know loves you more than anybody's ever loved you. And you know that means? That means that he always has your best interest at heart. Everything the Lord will do in your life and allow in your life, he's always got your best interest at heart. I tell young people what I preach to them, I say, you know, I, I, I could look back and I could look at the guys that were in my wedding. I look at the guys that I played ball with in high school. I look at the guys I went to college with. The great majority of them I never hear from anymore. And yet, you know, when we're younger, we think, man, I don't want to lose any friends. And oh, what, uh, you know, it all matters what they think about me. And I want to tell you something. As you get older, you realize all that matters is what he thinks. And he's guaranteed that he'll love you like nobody's ever loved you before. And Satan wants to deceive you into thinking that God's more about bondage than about freedom. Oh, if I give my life to the Lord, that you know, they're going to tell me I need to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And they're going to tell me I need to quit going here and I need, can't go here anymore and I shouldn't talk this way and I shouldn't be with these. But God's not about bondage. God's about freedom. And what, what the Lord has taken from me in my life, giving my life to him, what he's taken from me is only the things that have hurt me. Because he knows he made my life. Don't you think the designer knows how to maintain that life? And he's the designer and he knows what's going to give me the happiest life and what's going to be the most fulfilled life. And I want to tell you, the stinking old devil's a liar. And he'll make you think, boy, this is fun. You don't want to miss out on that. And at the end of that night of fun is shame and guilt and emptiness. And then he kicks back and laughs. But you see, everything my Lord gives me brings nothing but joy and peace and fulfillment. Because his love is perfect. Nobody will ever love you like he loves you. In the dark and difficult days, you'll find out really who loves you. And he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He told in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, he says to, to those young people, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't ever forget. Nobody will love you like he loves you. There's a boy who got rebellious towards his mom and dad. They loved him, but they had rules. He didn't like the rules, so he got rebellious. He's going to do his own thing. He can handle life, and so he took off. And he went to the big city, and and the world began to eat him up. It wasn't long until he had no money, he had no place to go, he had no food. He's struggling. About a year and a half has passed. His heartbroken daddy got on a train, started traveling from city to city to try to find his boy, burdened and brokenhearted. That boy was just determined he was going to do his own thing and do it his own way. One day, that dad was in a train station. And that boy didn't realize his daddy was in that train station. But he was also in that train station. And he's tapping people on the shoulder. Sir, you have a dime. Could you, could you lend me a little money? 
Is there some way you could give me something that I could get something to eat? And then he tapped on the shoulder, not knowing it was his daddy. His daddy turned around and he said, Sir, would you give me a dime? Not even looking up. He said, Son, give you a dime. Don't you know that everything I have is yours? And I want to tell you something. The old devil will chew you up and spit you out, but there's a God in heaven that loves you. And he's telling you, don't go running after what this world and the old devil has to offer. Everything I have is yours. Through the love of Jesus Christ, he has all the blessings abounding for us. There's another young boy that did pretty much the same thing. He ran away and got caught up in all the junk of the world and ended up on drugs and alcohol and his life was wasted and spent. His daddy had an a, a apple orchard. His way he, he farmed and made a living. And that boy sent a, a telegram home. It was back before they had cell phones and all that. He sent a telegram telegram home and said would you please forgive me or would you please let me come back home he said if if you will he said I'm going to travel I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hitchhike and, and walk as far as I can to get back home and when I get back home when I get up to the house if you'll tie around the post of the porch a white flag I'll know that you've forgiven me and I'm able to come home. But you see, it was a long, long dirt drive back into the house. And on each side was the apple orchards. And when the boy finally got near, he was nervous. And he started down the road to the house. When he got to the driveway, he looked up and he saw. He didn't have to wait to get to the front porch. There were flags on every tree. And I'm telling you, there's a Savior that loves you far more than any preacher could ever tell you. And regardless of what's happened in your life and regardless of the past, that Savior loves you tonight. And when he told his apostles, just remember me. Don't, don't ever forget the great sacrifice I made for you. And don't you ever forget nobody will ever love you like I love you. So why not let's give him our life? If he's that committed to us, why not us be committed to him? Now, I want you to understand something. The concept the world has of love is so messed up. And we sometimes think today, boy, you know that preacher, man, he, he got on me about something. He, I don't know, he's not very loving. That's not true. The, the truth is somebody that really loves is going to tell you the truth. And the truth is what sets you free. Somebody that holds back the truth from you doesn't love you. They're not, they're not trying to help you. And then when you come and hear the principles and you hear the preaching and all of that, and, you know, well, man, they're, they're telling me I shouldn't do this. and shouldn't. They're doing that because they love you. Because the truth is what sets us free. Well, not only does he want us to remember that nobody will love us like he loves us, number two, he wants us to realize and never forget that sin is the greatest enemy in your life. Sin is the greatest enemy in your life. In 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and here is where we have the Corinthian church to practice that remembrance of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, it tells us in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Psalm 58, verse 3, it says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as, as soon as they be born, speaking lies. And I want you to understand, your greatest enemy is sin. And we were born with a sin nature. Now, again, the world doesn't believe that. But that's what the Bible tells us. We're born with a sin nature. I have four children. I have three boys and a, and a daughter. You know, I never had to teach one of those boys to pull her, their sister's hair. <laughs> it 
just came natural. And we're sinners by nature. It's just in us. That's why we need a Savior. And it's in every one of us. And sometimes people think, well, you know, man, I've been through these addictions and I've got this and that, you know, and boy, you know, you don't know what it's like to grow You grew up in a Christian home. I want you to know something. I grew up in a Christian home. My, my old nature is as wicked and sinful as anybody else. And I had to get the Lord's forgiveness as well. And we have that old sin in us. And it's the biggest battle we fight. You know, I, I heard a preacher one time tell about, man, the, 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 I have an enemy that is constantly fighting me, constantly attacking me. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, I'd like to get a hold of that guy. And then he said, and that person is the one I saw in the mirror this morning when I shaved. And that's absolutely true. I mean, we're, we're our own worst enemy. We got sin nature born within us. And it creates chaos everywhere it exists. You know, society, the home, the church, our individual lives, sin is what causes all of the grief, all of the heartache. It's called the accursed thing. The Bible compares sin to, that, to the venom of snakes, the, the stench of rotting flesh, the oozing sores of a deadly plague, filthy garments. It says that sin stains the soul. It degrades dignity. It darkens the mind. It, it turns a beauty into, into ugliness. It turns joy to misery. It turns peace to war. It turns love to hate. And the saddest thing is it lurks within every one of us. And when we get saved, that old sin nature is not done away with. It's just now when we get saved, our spirit is born anew. And we're alive to God, but we've got that old sin nature that still is going to battle us. So why as a Christian do I keep struggling with this? Because that old sin nature doesn't want you to, to give in to the Lord's will. And it's going to fight you till we see Jesus. But greater is he that's within you than he that's within this world. When you are saved and the Spirit of God comes to dwell within you, you have the opportunity to live victoriously. And you don't have to give in to that sin nature. And that's why the, the, the principles and all just keep getting you back into the Word of God. And, and that Psalm 1 passage that we quoted just gets you back into meditating on the Word of God because that's where the power comes to renew our minds so that we won't give in to that sin temptation. Sin is our greatest enemy. Sometimes people think, man, if I could just have a, 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 you know, a, a job where everybody's saved and my boss is a Christian and, and you know, they promote us to read the Bible and, boy, if we just had a president that, that loved God and, and all of our, our senators and government officials all just loved God and, you know, man, it would just be wonderful. Then I could make it. No, you wouldn't. And in fact, the Bible tells us that after the, the Lord's rapture and takes us out of this old world and then after seven years of tribulation, the Bible says the Lord's going to come back and we're going to come back with him and he's going to reign on this earth for a thousand years. Amen. And during that thousand year reign, the Bible says that Jesus will be the king. And during that thousand year reign, it says the lamb and the lion will lay down together. And yet, amazing thing, it's going to be perfect. But there are going to be people born who's going to still be born of this flesh. And during that thousand years, there's going to be people who are born of this flesh that came through the tribulation period. And they're going to be producing children that still have a sin nature. And even though all everything is just perfect, at the end of it, they're going to put together an army and try to rebel against the Lord's kingdom. You know why? Because that old sin nature. It's not about what's around us. It's about what's going on within us. Sin is our greatest enemy that we'll ever deal with. We are inherently rebellious. It is our nature. And that's why we've got to stay in the Word of God. That's why you've got to get in a good church. Can I tell you, it's not enough just to go to church. You've got to get into a Bible preaching church. You've got to get in a church that's going to be true to the book. You know, thank God. I've known Brother Slaybaugh for a lot of years. And I'll tell you, that guy is committed to the Word of God. It's not about what I want. It's not about what the people want. It's about what does God say. 
you've got to get in a church that's going to preach and teach Bible truth. And you need to be there every time the doors are open. I need to be there every time the doors are open. Our sister gave testimony earlier. The kids were sick for two weeks. Man, her heart was just hungry to get in church. Doesn't matter how long we've been saved. We need it. God, God set it up to be that way. And that's the key to battling that sin temptation because it's within every one of us. It's our biggest enemy that we'll ever face. Number three, he told him, I want you to remember me. He said, don't forget how much I love you. Nobody will ever love you like I love you. He said, don't forget your biggest enemy is sin. I'm going to tell you, you need to get sick of sin. You ought to see it as your, that temptation that has brought you so much guilt and so much shame. It's, you ought to develop a hatred for that. you got to just despise it. I was telling our brother earlier, I said, you know, there was two old fellows who were sitting on a porch rocking. And, uh, of course, this was in the south. You'll understand it better in the south. And the old, old dog is laying over here on the porch, you know, and they're just rocking and that old dog's just a howling. One guy says, the other guy said, what's wrong with Blue? Oh, he said, he's laying on a nail. He said, well, why doesn't he get off of it? He said, don't hurt bad enough yet. <laughs> and when your sin hurts you bad enough, you get sick of it. And you say, dear God, I, need over I don't want this anymore. Because sin hurts you. It hurts those you love, and it hurts your Savior. And then he says, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, he said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So he wanted his, his apostles to remember, don't forget I'm coming back. One day you'll stand before me. Don't forget that. As a Christian, we won't stand before him and give an account of our sin because that's covered in the blood of Christ when we get saved. But we'll, we will stand before him during the beam of judgment when rewards are handed out or loss of reward. And at that judgment, we will give an account for the opportunities we've had to serve him and to live for him and to influence our family for Christ and influence our neighbors for Christ and be faithful in church and give our tithes and study our Bibles and grow in the Lord. We will give an account in that. Not for our sin, but for the opportunities we had. And the Bible says the Lord's going to look at us and say, so what would you do with those opportunities? What would you do? I gave you a church that loved you enough and a pastor that loved you enough that, man, he had an RU program to help folks. And What would you do with that? Did you do the studies? Did you make the effort? I'm going to tell you, Christianity doesn't work by osmosis. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you can sleep on your Bible and wake up super Christian in the morning. You've got to put in effort. It takes work. But it's worth it. It's sure worth it. And so he said, don't forget, one day I'm coming back. 1 John 2, at verse 28, it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And isn't that a great goal? That when he comes, we could have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. What if it were tonight? Anything between you and the Lord tonight? There are things you know you ought to be doing you're not doing. There are things you ought to stop doing that you keep on doing. Could you be able to see them and not be so ashamed when you look upon those scars in his hands and in his side and on his brow and know that nobody's ever loved you like he loved you? And what'd you do with it? I remember... There was a fellow who was a public school principal in the town where I went to high school. And um, our pastor had been by to see him and tried to win him to Christ. And he said, well, I, I just, you know, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm ready for that. And I just need to think about it. And I, I don't know. And his wife was a Christian, but he wasn't. 
And they lived just a block away from the fire station in town. And uh, one night about 2 o'clock in the morning, the alarm went off in that fire station. When my pastor had witnessed to him, he told him, he says, well, I'm going to tell you, you can put it off if you want to, but there's going to be a time that Jesus comes and you won't have another chance to be saved. When that fire alarm went off at 2 o'clock in the morning, he woke up and he thought, Man, he came. I missed it. And he couldn't wait to get to the preacher's house and say, listen, I need to get saved right now. I thought I missed it. But he is coming back. I guarantee you that. And what a blessed time it will be for those who are excited and ready to see him. I preached in Ypsilanti, Michigan one time, and they were having a celebration of a guy in their church. They called him Doc. And it was Doc's 100th birthday. Everybody in the church loved him. He was faithful. Years ago, he, he sang specials in Billy Sunday Revival meetings. And they said, Doc, come on up to the pulpit and give a testimony. 100 years old. He walked up to the pulpit. They said he never missed Sunday morning. He never missed Sunday night. He never missed Wednesday night. He didn't miss visitation. 100 years old. He got up behind the pulpit and they said, How is it that you've stayed faithful to the Lord all these years? Well, he says, you know, he said, I just, I just always believe that one of these days I'm not going to go with the undertaker, I'm going with the upper taker. I just believe Jesus is coming any minute. He said, I've just believed that all my life. He said, you know, years ago, he said, I heard somebody preach, and he said, I just realized Jesus is coming, and I've always believed that I'm not going to go with the undertaker, I'm going to go with the upper taker. And then he'd come back around and he says, you know, there was a long time ago I heard a preacher preach about Jesus coming and I've just always believed that I'm not going down with the undertaker, I'm going with the undertaker. He said that, repeated it about seven times. He was 100 years old. And you know what I thought? Thank God, what a good place to be stuck. Knowing that he's coming. It motivated him every day of his life. There was a daddy years ago that lived a little bit out from town and so he, he had to go in about once a week to get groceries and take care of business in town and he hitched up the wagon and took his little boy with him and they go, went on into town. When they got into town, all of a sudden just, a, a, just an outpour, thunderstorm and just rain began to just pour and and that dad said to his little boy, he said, Son, I want you to stand right here by the lampstand. I've got to go across the street there to the bank and take care of some business, son. Now, I want you to just stay right here. He said, now, now, don't go anywhere. Don't go with anybody. Just stay right here. Well, when he first told him that, the rain hadn't started pouring yet. The thunderstorm hadn't hit. But as he got into the bank, all of a sudden, it just unleashed. And I mean, it was just a torrential downpour. And that little boy is just getting soaked. And he's standing by that lampstand. And the people in the store right in front of him opened the, 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 the door up and said, Come on, son, come on inside. You're, you're going to get pneumonia standing out there. You're, you're soaking wet. And he said, Oh, no, no, no. He said, I can't go in there. He said, You see, my daddy told me, Stand right here. That he's coming back. And I want him to find me right where he told me to be. I want to tell you something. The Lord's given me the grace to preach for 39 years now. But I sure want, if he chooses to come in my lifetime, for him to find me standing right where he told me to stand. You know, that's the opportunity for every child of God. The Lord told his apostles, just remember these things. This will be my last time to fellowship with you. I'm going to go suffer. I'm going to ascend on high. But just remember this, nobody will ever love you like I've loved you. Sin will be your greatest enemy. It'll break that fellowship where I can't bless you like I want to bless you. And don't ever forget I'm coming back. And you'll see me again one day. I challenge you tonight, isn't he worthy of our best? Does that mean we're perfect? No, not a one of us, not a one of us. It doesn't matter how many years I've been preaching. My wife reminds me I'm not perfect yet. 
Amen. We all still battle with that whole sin nature, but battle it. Don't give in to it. Battle it. You battle it with the Word of God. And that's why church helps you so much when you've got a preacher preaching the truth. It helps you. You don't want to miss any of it. It's got to be a priority. One day, when he comes back, wouldn't it be a blessing that he finds you standing right where he told you to stand? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for loving us, Lord. When we look at how much you love us and how faithful you are to us, sometimes we're almost ashamed of the little bit of love that we offer to thee. So help us tonight. I pray, Lord, that some would allow you to examine their own hearts and maybe there's some tonight that know things right now that if you did come, things they're not doing they ought to be doing, things that they keep on doing that they know you want them to stop doing. Would you help them, Lord? And help us to give you our, our lives afresh and new to thee. And Lord, in a crowd this size, there's a good chance somebody is here that's never been saved. Maybe they've trusted their good works or maybe they've trusted a church or they've just never had that time when they sincerely with a repentful heart call on thee and ask you to forgive them of sin and trusted what you did for them at Calvary to pay for their sin and give their hearts to thee. So help, I pray, draw that heart. Our heads are bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, nobody looking. I want to ask you tonight, if you could say honestly, if I died right this minute, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. Oh, not because I'm good. I know I'm not better than anybody. But I can tell you, Brother Booth, I could tell you where it was when I was convicted of my sin. I'm not talking about some emotional, you saw some vision or some people come up with. I'm talking about you remember when you were convicted that you were a sinner deserving to spend an eternity in hell. Somebody showed you from the Bible that the answer was trusting Christ. And with a repentful heart, you call on the Lord Jesus and ask Him to forgive you and save you. And you gave your heart to Him. And you know that you were saved. You were born again at that moment. And you can honestly say, thank God I know if I died that I'd spend eternity in heaven. If that's your honest answer, would you raise your hand? You know that for sure. You can go to the place where you know you got saved. Thank you. You may put your hands down. I didn't do that to embarrass anybody. I promise you that. But there's no greater decision to make. All the rest of these principles, all this stuff, won't matter a hill of beans until you begin that relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no power outside of that. But he's a life changer when you give him, his, you give him your heart. I wonder how many would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, but during the message, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart tonight. I know there's things he wants different. If he was to come, I know there's things that need to be different. There's priorities that need to be changed. I need to get faithful in church. I need to get faithful in the Bible every day. I need, I need to serve him. Brother Booth, I, I just there's things I know if I stood before him today that he's not pleased with and I need to get, I need to get right with him. I need to battle that sin, that temptation. I need his victory. And God spoke to my heart as a Christian. Some things need to change. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up, Christian? God bless you. Thank God for you. Thank you. You may put your hands down. I'm going to pray in just a moment. But I want to ask you tonight, who would say, I couldn't raise my hand that I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. I was honest about it. I've got doubts. I don't want to die and go to hell. If the Lord loved me that much and he paid that price for me, I'd like to know I'm forgiven and saved. And if I could really know that from the Bible, and by the way, you can know that for sure from the Bible. Say, so if I can know that for sure from the Bible, I'd like to know that for sure. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Put it up and put it down. I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I won't point you out. I would like to pray for you if you'd let me. Yeah, that's me. I, I couldn't raise my hand before, but I'm raising it now. I really need to be saved. I need to be forgiven. I've never in my, all my ministry ever gotten used to anybody not raising their hand that they were saved and not raising their hand that they wanted to be saved. 
I'd never have gotten used to anybody not wanting my Lord. You say, well, I'm not rejecting him. Sure you are. You've got to make a choice. You either accept him or you reject him. There's no in between. And I hope, I hope you'll get that settled. After I pray, why don't you take a minute, if you need to pray as a Christian, why don't you just take a minute to pray at your seat? God spoke to your heart. If you're not sure you're saved, would you please not leave that way? If you'll just find one of us workers here and say, man, could I talk to you a minute? And I, I'd like to see from the Bible how I could be saved. We would be our thrill to show you from the Scripture how to be saved. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless now. And Lord, things that we've considered tonight, thank you for tender hearts and a lot of hands were raised among Christians, Lord, that just need to get some things in order and priority and settled on thee, Lord, and get faithful to thee. And So I pray you'd help them. I pray, God, that you'd uh, just uh, work in their hearts and continue to guide and lead them and help them, Lord, to have the strength and the the, uh, the desire, Lord, to, to want to be faithful to Thee, to love You as much as You love them, and to get into the Word of God and allow You to change their hearts and lives. And then, Lord, those not sure they're saved, those that didn't raise their hand saying that they could, could testify of where they got saved and born again, Lord, would You work in their hearts? God, would You give them courage to just speak to one of us and say, I'd, I'd really like to see that from the Bible how I could be saved and forgiven. So do your work now. We thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen.